Before long, Chopin had met many of the celebrities and had become a member of their circle. His charm and refined manners opened for him many doors. His genius was admired everywhere. Franz Liszt, called the greatest pianist of the century, became his intimate friend. Liszt was then the titan of the keyboard, but Chopin could move the audiences to tears with the delicate and poetic playing of his famous nocturnes. These were the most happy and fruitful years in Chopin's life. He created treasures of music, most of it for the piano. Sonatas, ballads, impromptus, nocturnes, polonaises, waltzes, mazurkas, and the incomparable etudes. Chopin was a perfectionist and wrote slowly, constantly polishing a phrase, changing a harmony, until even so brief a piece as the minute waltz required a good deal of work. As a pianist, Chopin was greatly admired for his graceful and brilliant technique. He became a teacher who could command a very high fee. Wealthy ladies of high rank begged to be accepted as his students. The elegant, romantic-looking young man with the sad eyes was now a welcome guest in the drawing rooms of the aristocracy. At one of these glittering parties, he met the woman who was destined to become his closest friend and his true love, George Sand. George Sand, whose real name was Aurora Dudevan, had a brilliant mind and a great amount of energy. She was a successful writer and knew everybody who had won fame as an artist, musician, or intellectual. At first sight, she felt drawn to the young composer, who seemed so frail and, despite his success, so sad. Chopin had just recovered from a severe cold and high fever, which left his lungs weakened. George Sand started to look after him. When his health would not improve, 
she persuaded Frederick to go south with her. They chose the Spanish island of Mallorca, which was known for its sunny, mild climate. There, in restful seclusion, Chopin would certainly regain his strength. flowers reached down to the blue sea. Chopin began to feel much better. He had his piano shipped from Paris and spent long hours working on his preludes. Often he went on sightseeing trips around the beautiful countryside. Unfortunately, on one of those excursions, Chopin got a chill and fell sick again. Several doctors were summoned and they all agreed, sadly shaking their heads, that the patient was suffering from an incurable lung disease. He might recover for a while, but not for long. Chopin the cruel truth, but he sensed it, and he fell into deep melancholy. To make things worse, the weather changed with the beginning of winter. Endless rains drummed on the roof, and dense fog covered the lovely gardens. From the nearby monastery came the dull sound of bells ringing for a long time. Chopin shivered with a dark foreboding. He dragged himself to the piano and caught the mood of hopelessness in music. Out of his despair, he created one of the greatest masterpieces, his prelude in D-flat major. with its gaiety and brilliant lights, with its elegant boulevards where a happy crowd promenaded. He begged George Sand to return with him to the city. After a long journey, which greatly exhausted Chopin, the party arrived in Marseille. There he seemed to recover, and George Sand invited him to her chateau in the country near Paris. Now, surrounded by loving friends, enjoying every comfort of an elegant home, Chopin rallied amazingly. Some of his most superb works were written during these years. The Sonata in B-flat minor with the Funeral March, a ballad, a scherzo, several mazurkas, 
and the triumphant Polonaise in A major. This piece he dedicated to a future king in a free Poland. Hats off, gentlemen. Here comes a genius. Franz Liszt was not only a devoted friend, but also his greatest admirer. In his recital repertoire, he always included pieces by Chopin. When the master himself appeared on a concert stage, which was not very often, the house would be sold out weeks in advance. Life was again wonderful, till the time came when the relationship between Chopin and George Sand changed. The temperamental woman and the sickly, nervous man had some violent quarrels. In the end, they decided to part. For Chopin, this separation did not mean freedom. It meant a broken heart. tried to rearrange his life. He found out that his finances were in bad shape. Always generous and charitable, he had given great sums to Polish refugees and impoverished friends. Now he was faced with the necessity to earn money as quickly as possible, and he welcomed an invitation for a concert tour through England and Scotland. With amazing willpower, Chopin bore the strain of traveling, playing, and accepting countless social engagements. But in his letters to friends, Chopin complained about the damp climate and the fog in London to which he was unaccustomed. His strength was ebbing away. When Chopin returned to Paris in 1848, emaciated and feverish, he was a dying man. still faithful to his own country. In his last hours, he was surrounded by all of his closest friends. Near the bed stood the silver goblet he had received long ago. When I am dead, he whispered, scatter the good Polish earth over the grave, and I shall find rest in the soil of my native land. They did as he had wished, while Chopin's own funeral march was being played.
Frederick Chopin is remembered as the poet of the piano. It was through the keyboard alone that he unlocked the magic of his dreams. His music is loved and played in every land, a universal language of beauty that knows no barriers of nation or country.